Kelly Dumar is a poet, photographer, playwright, and workshop facilitator. Her earlier days, she worked in creative arts counseling, and her early writing began with journaling work, eventually leading to poetry and plays. These days, her poetry, her prose, and her photographs have been published in many literary journals, including Bellevue Literary Review, Tupelo Quarterly, Kindred, Sliver of Stone, to name a few. Kelly also founded and produces our Voices Festival of Women Playwrights at Wellesley College, and now in its 11th year. She teaches creative workshops locally, nationally, and online. She founded Farm Pond Writers Collective of Women Writers in Sherborne, and on the faculty and board of International Women's Writing Guild. Kelly has a writing, creative writing and uh, na nature photography blog called New This Day, involving daily walks in nature. And she is the author of two poetry chat books, All These Cures and Tree of the Apple. And Kelly notes in her website in particular, she loves to write about truth and beauty in life. And she is here to share a bit of both her art of photography, uh, photographs of others, which she does in her work, as well as her poetry. So please welcome Kelly Dumas. Give you three, three minutes for you, right? Okay. Thank you. And you, yes. Okay. Wow, it's so wonderful to be here. I'm honored to be invited and to be, um, thank you, Cheryl, for inviting me and to um, present my poetry and some photographs. And, you know, Cheryl invited me also to talk a little bit about my process. Um, of writing from photographs. And so um, I'm definitely going to read for you, but I'm also going to try to tell a little bit about how I use photographs, mostly personal photographs, original photographs that I take, not all of them, to um, find the poem, to write the poem from the photo. And this is a poem have you ever had that experience? You've got, you find a photograph in the family archive and it grabs your attention. It arrests your attention. It stops you. And you feel like there is a mystery in the photo. There is perhaps even a myth in the photo. There are secrets in the photo. There are stories in the photo. And this was the first really explicitly photo-inspired poem that I ever wrote. This is a picture of my Aunt Marion. And I, fa I spent, um, in my early 20s, she died. And I took care of her in the last few days of her life uh, with another aunt of mine. And it was really years later that I found this photograph. And the two experiences of being with her at her death and finding this photo of her earlier life sort of uh, they were like a cataclysm. They just really smashed together for me. And um, I loved this photo. It spoke to me so much because I felt, oh my God, it's Artemis, goddess of the hunt. And it really, really began to unravel the, the idea of the myth, Diana, the archer, the arrow pointing, and then having been with her at the experience of um, a too short life in her 50s. Um, and she had been kind of a guide in many ways in my life as a child. And one thing she did was she took her nieces and nephews on climbs out Mount Monadnock in New Hampshire. And uh, so the poem that came from this photo was, is called Monadnock. This perfect aim you take points towards some mysterious, unconventional life. You will never marry, wear dresses, make excuses. You will love animals and women, raise dogs, 
teach other people's children. Baked dry as a bone, you will bring poncho and bear back from the desert to bathe in Laurel Lake, reeking of sage, telling Indian stories. You will teach us to hike, to sing as we climb. M-O-U-N-T-M-O-N-A-D-N-O-C-K. It's the thrill of your life when you get to the top, they say. This perfect aim you take toward us. Someday, when I am almost grown, you'll be too sick to climb from your bed for one last swim I should help you take, your bloated belly rising like Monadnock between us, death rattling your breath. You will die at dawn in my arms before you go, taking perfect aim towards some mysterious peak I will someday climb. So I, as Cheryl mentioned, I do walk in the woods daily and I, I take photographs of nature. And um, I just, they, you know, the things call me and I take a photograph of them. And because I'm a dramatist, I always really think of, I like to think about photographs as being like a director creating a stage picture that everything on the stage matters and it's there for a reason and that it's, my one of my roles is, is to sort of look at it and understand the reason for every element of the of the photograph but it really wasn't until I took this photograph and it was it really wasn't until I was posting it in my blog that I realized that there was one seed left in this husk of the milkweed and um, I hadn't consciously seen that and so I think the photographs that I'm drawn to write from are also a, a way of getting into some of my own unconscious process so this was written um, after the election also um, last year, a year ago, and it's called Milkweed, Late December. You are a seed, one in particular. I am empty of milk, a weed, wintering husk, a country you belonged. August was sun-sealed, my pouch, your plenty. November is blown. You are fastened to ruin. So what if you waste your one, your only? This is another short poem about something I photographed in nature. Um, this magnificent mushroom that I just found growing in my yard. And I wrote the poem called Fruit Body. A mushroom moons me in my backyard, gigantic globe, bright beaming, its cratered face my way, troubling my crust, claiming its fistful of my dirt, my blackest hearty soil. A fruiting cosmos, cosmos quickens every inch by inch, my aging, earthly skin. This is actually a collection of some leaves I took, and mostly of the, the beach one winter, and um, it's another nature poem where, um, I mean, these have been collected into this um, graphic. However, I did, I just started crazily one winter photographing beech leaves that I saw and um, couldn't stop. That got a little obsessive for a while, and finally then I wrote this poem called Winter Beach. It's cold. In the mirror these mornings, I wake up to this face with new lines laying tracks over loosening skin. It's cold in the woods as I walk into wind shaking the bony leaves, limbs of hardwoods where I am learning to believe in beech leaves, diaphanous in winter, lasting so long on their branches they let go by accident 
falling into footprints of hikers, dogs, deer, how they shimmer on snow, lighting the way into these woods, like gold leaf brushed on whitest blue canvas, showing me how any release may land in catastrophe or something improvisational as grace. If I say, yes, I am aging, aging, I may never stop being how beauty is. Uh, so in your archive, you might also have uh, sort of iconic photographs. These are iconic photograph of my parents. They used to go every year to Bermuda. And their vacations there just meant the world to them. And um, one November, they always went in November. Uh, this, this actual photo inspired a poem that happened at a different time, but they connected for me these two stories. And uh, Horseshoe Beach in Bermuda was one of the places they loved to go. This is a prose piece, prose poem. From Horseshoe Beach, The View. You ride the motorbike, a rental to this good luck named beach. Your wife, a happy passenger, is craving solitude and sun and no children to mind. She lays her towel on pinkish sand and kneels, her back against the limestone cliffs. Her view is of the sea. One other couple shares the beach, and this is how it feels to be remote. In this season of sunbathing, no lifeguard is on duty to stop tourists from swimming or drowning. You watch her husband estimate his strength and stroke against the swells and current he can see. How he calculates his risk and what it costs to play it safe or venture out. He makes his choice. On this honeymoon of beach, in place of one you never took, you watch the waves and make your guess and choose your wife, who has her beauty. You have this middle age, your towel touching hers. You choose the heated calm of easy love, the rocking, restful sound of surf. When the swimmer out to sea starts waving wildly to his wife for hope, for life, her screaming asks you for another choice. You calculate his strength, your stroke. You guess the distance know the cost, you pick your towel up off the sand and leave your wife and swim, your lifelong, your lifeline dragging like a weight. From shore, the wives watch how the swimmers chose and feel the cost. This is part two. Um, it's called Horseshoe Beach Revisited. A small, smart, a small spark may perhaps lie hid, the Royal Humane Society. The parchment flown by airmail arrives at our home in 1969. With a paring knife, my mother slits the seal of the envelope, unrolls the commendation, reads aloud the elegant calligraphy from the Royal Humane Society, patron of Her Majesty the Queen, our grubby fingers reach. No, you can't touch it. Soon, behind glass, in a sealed document frame, it appears on the wall of the bedroom she shares with my father. For 30 years, we look and don't touch. After she dies, when he sells the house, we pack everything for my father. Lifting the commendation off the hook, we wrap it in newspaper, pack it in a box we label for his new home with Sylvia. This is where we hang it on his bedroom wall. Later, when we move my father and Sylvia, this time into independent living, we wrap and pack and hang it in his new bedroom. Soon, when he moves into memory care, we hang it for him one last time. And during visits, we show him pictures, like this one. We take him on so many trips to Bermuda with my mother. We ask, we sorry, we take his arm and point to the recommendation. With some prompting, he reads the printed calligraphy to us. It was resolved unanimously 
that the honorary testimonial of this society inscribed in parchment, hereby given to Dustin Burke for having on the 6th of November, 1968, gone to the rescue of a man who was in imminent danger of drowning in the sea off Horseshoe Beach at South Shore Road, Southampton, Bermuda, and whose life he gallantly assisted to save. One visit, we find an empty hook. We look under his bed, the shower, the closet, a drawer. We search and imagine the voice of our mother asking, how could you have hung it here? Where residents pass through unlocked doors, entering and exiting each other's privacy with treasure they have no idea doesn't belong to them. Look, look at what has gone missing. We call Marge, the cheerful unit director, report it lost, and Marge is hopeful. She will rescue it from another resident's room. She will know exactly who belongs to it. She will know our father's name, printed in calligraphy on parchment from the queen. Marge dispatches the entire staff to search the unit. Within a few days, Marge calls to tell us the commendation is in her office, where we insist it should remain under lock and key until we retrieve it. We drive right over and carry it home. And so you see the photograph became the cover of my chapbook, Tree of the Apple. And um, one of the poems from this chapbook, so my father had Alzheimer's, died, what are you pointing? Okay, no, th thank you, my helper. Uh, <laughs> so uh, my father had Alzheimer's, and uh, this chapbook is primarily uh, poems that I wrote throughout the years of um, living with his Alzheimer's. This is uh, this poem is called "How He Asks." Where did you come from? By this I mean, what fills your days, and how did you lose me? I mean, when did I leave you, and how did you find me somewhere? Let's go back to the beginning. How did you get here? By this I mean, tell me how I brought you into this world, and what are you doing with this life you've been given? Are you doing the wonderful I knew you could do? There's something you forgot. By this I mean, Tell me the news of all the everyone we have back there who matter so much, and when can I see them to tell them how whistling and crackling and sunny they are? Are you leaving? Let's go back to the beginning. Where did you come from? Did you come in a car? Take me home now so you'll see how we got here from there. And by this I mean, do you know how much your life matters. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to do this one. Portal Nearing 60. This is uh, very much a photo uh, inspired poem in the sense that I wrote directly from each of the photos um, in answer to a call for uh, poems about on the theme of frailty. And um, so I wrote this, a portal nearing 60, that's my age, um, nearing. Um, there is nothing more vigorous, nothing more vulnerable or vigorous than a woman coming of age. Ceremony is improvised. A portal opens out of driftwood. Far out on a beach, you cross a threshold. Daughter, you are orphaned now, and swim into the sweep of sea, into your age of all that is yet. Reverence isn't spun in church on Christmas morning. It's anchored by branches and daylight and glitter on a walk after rain. Renewal roots in a gorgeous empty. 
resting on the steps of a wedding anniversary, your 30th, stamped in the hollow of who has flown, you see the proof of who remains. Humility is kneeling in the grass near the barred feather of an owl you can't see, who is watching over this territory, territory you are only passing through. Risk is wanting what is homeless, unrooted as a seed. Fertility is, I carried them, all, even the ones who were seeds never born. Gestation is a wintering wingless bird, iced in a sculpture of flight. Ardor rushes like blood through cracks in the veins of an icy mood in your melting season. Thank you. How many miles did these wheels travel across pastures, the time-worn bones of a machine that harvested hay? I can hear the roar of the engine and see the farmer bouncing along on that metal seat open to the sky, all the while keeping note of the sun's position overhead to be sure he gets home in time for dinner. He wore a logo cap from John Deere, or burpee seed perhaps, and sweated out a gallon in the summer heat, fending off the flies, before abandoning his labor as dusk set in. He taught his young son to drive on this machine before the boy's foot could reach the pedal. Sitting on his father's lap, he'd proudly steer and dream of being a farmer one day like his dad. And after he leaves the tra tractor mid-row, he walks home, tired, dirty, hungry, but satisfied to work the land and share his hope for the next generation, imagining no better life than the one they are in. Thank you. I have saved small bits of time, like pennies, so I can spend them here where I am held by the tangled wild beauty strewn all around. Leaning on a fallen trunk propped in the crook of another, I watch an oak leaf drift down river. A wood thrush whistles. The wind flutters the tree's crisp <coughs> leaves and brushes my face. This patch of woods is not sculpted or grand or glorious. It's like the beauty of your mother, of her familiar hands. You don't care how fancy her hair is or how many creases spread around her kind eyes. She just needs to be there with you. And so I return to this place that longs to fill my open palms with yellow leaves and piles of burnished acorns. Thank you. I never been to Mexico, never rode a rodeo across the desert south to Timbuktu Never found that pot of gold Never thought that I'd get old There is much that I will never do And now I Sitting in my chair Thinking about where I might have been I'm too soon old And too late smart I'm looking for the light Before the dark 
I never sailed the Amazon Never ran a marathon Never found someone whose love was true Never did what I was told I was on that glory road Where one day I met my Waterloo Yes, and now I am An old man Still sitting in my chair Thinking about where I might have been I'm too soon old And too late smart Still looking for the light Before the dark And though my youth it was misspent All my sins I now repent And hope it's not too late To make my mark For as long as I am here Might as well get off my chair And find the light Before it gets too dark And find the light Before it gets too dark Thank you.